Going through a breakup is never fun. In fact, in certain instances, it can be downright heartbreaking and you may feel like you're never going to get through it. To help you have the tools available on how to cope with this situation, especially if you share children, is relationship coach and relationship columnist for the West End Times newspaper, Frank B. Kermit. Frank, thanks again for joining us on The Kelly Alexander Show. Thank you, Kelly. Great to be here. Frank, what's the first thing that you should do with yourself You know, after you break up with someone or if you get broken up with and, you know, if you're sort of a family unit. Okay, well, if there are children involved, the first thing you better make sure is that this is an actual final breakup. This isn't just a temporary leave of absence where you both need to get your thoughts collected. The reason you want to make sure that this is an actual end of the relationship is because when you do finally communicate this to your children, and you must communicate this together, You may now have an ex, but you are still partners when it comes to raising your children. If you tell your children that, yes, we are separating, and then later on you guys work it out and go back to trying to have a family unit, that does not create an environment that is stable for children. And it could have negative impact on them where they realize that nothing is stable and that getting together, breaking up, getting together, breaking up is part of a normal course of a relationship. Now, in every relationship, you are going to fight. You are going to have disagreements. You may very well need to leave each other's space uh, temporarily, but to get together, break up, get together, break up, get together, break up is not an emotionally healthy relationship, but if that's what your children are seeing, that's what they're going to pick up. They're going to say, oh, this is the norm, and if your child grows up and ends up in an emotionally healthy relationship that doesn't have these constant breakups back and forth, they're going to assume that they have a bad relationship and they'll walk away from emotionally healthy relationships. It's called attachment theory. It's very important that you're sure that this end is the final end before you talk to your children. And if you do have, you know, children together, Frank, I'm assuming that, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but I'm assuming that in a way their needs surpass your own because, you know, they're little and they need lots of support, you know, going through the changes ahead. And even if they're not so little, even if they're, you know, 14, it's still, I think, above their emotional understanding point. It's very important when you talk to your kids that, you know, you talk to your kids as a couple and you say that although we're not going to be together anymore and we're not getting along, we still love you and you have to reinforce this for your partner. So even though you may be angry at your partner, you still have to remind the kids that your partner is still a good parent. And if you're not supporting one another in this, it's going to damage your children on an emotional level. And emotionally damaged children end up turning on the parents by trying to manipulate the situation to their advantage, turning the parents against each other. It's very important that as parents you must remain on the same page even if you're not going to be life partners anymore. And how do you handle, you know, contentious situation around the kids? Because I'm assuming that the less they see you fight, the better. So if you are, you know, you know things are going badly and it's looking like it's the end, is it very important that you have these discussions when the kids are at school or asleep and they're not going to hear you? Well, to assume that the kids are asleep and in another room and not hearing you, this is what most people think, and it doesn't work. We've all been kids who have pretended to sleep so we could see what exactly is going on and try to listen in. If you have to have these fights, if you have to have these discussions, yes, you try to have them out of your children's ear range, Sometimes that's not possible. We're all human, and we all have different temperaments. We, we all reach a point sometimes where we just have to let it out now. And that's unfortunate if we can't control our tempers when we're around children. So as much as possible, you want to limit this because you have to remember, even in couples that stay together long term, whenever they fight, and assuming they do it in front of the children, children do not have the concept of what happens after they go to bed. So here's an example. A couple who was very much in love and they were together for many, many years, they would often have fights. Now, the fights wouldn't be really bad, but they would be, you know, arguments and everything. From, well, what's for dinner tonight? Well, I don't know. I didn't make anything. Well, why didn't you make something? The child picks up, wow, the two of you are always fighting. What the child doesn't see is that, okay, after the initial blowout or whatnot, the couple actually makes up, they get intimate, they, have, they, they reconnect after a lousy day of work. But the child doesn't see that part, so all the child sees is, wow, these two people are always at each other's throats. So you have to remember that if you are the type of couple 
that has outbursts in front of the children, the children need to see the intimacy. The children need to see the caring and the affection you have for one another. Children will not just assume that it's all oh, what's happening behind my back. If they don't have that capacity, especially if they're younger. How do you make sure that the children do not blame themselves for your breakup? Because it just feels like it's going to come crashing down on their heads. It's important to understand that children view themselves as the center of their universe. So a child may have this interpretation. My parents are splitting up because they got really, really mad. Well, why did they get mad? Well, the last time they got really mad, it's because I didn't clean up my room. So they must have got mad. They must have thought about that. So they're breaking up because of me. Because the child does not have the concept that maybe the parents have been unhappy for a long time. And there's a lot of unresolved issues there that are beyond the scope of the child's understanding. So it's not about trying to avoid it. It's understanding that's what's going to happen. Those kids are going to blame themselves because that's how children think. In regards to the fact that when they're younger, you know, they're, they're sort of very focused on themselves, does that continue into to teenagehood too? Like would they be blaming themselves for your breakup at like, you know, 15, 16, 17? Some children will because, again, they may not have the capacity to understand that mom and dad or dad and dad and mom and mom have their own problems. At the teenage level, they're going through so many other things in their development, trying to form their own identity, trying to find their place in the world. Maybe they've got their own issues that they're dealing with that they aren't sharing with anybody because they have nobody to, to be a confidant with. And this is just one more thing in their life that's not working out. So will the child, or in this case, will the teenager blame themselves? They can. If they feel, because again, you have adults who feel that they are at fault for everybody else's misery. This is a learned behavior. So you might have a teenager who has that. A teenager who may not have that is still going to look at this as an example of why nothing works out in life and what's the point. And that's a very, very dangerous attitude for a teenager to have, especially when at that point in their lives, they are tempted by people who would do them wrong, who would do them harm, who try to get them involved in things that they shouldn't be getting involved in. Frank, I, I don't even know if you can answer this, but I just want to put this out there. And I suppose that it, it depends on, on an individual basis, I guess. But if you could comment on it anyway, is there an age where a child would handle this better? Like, is it better that they're beneath 10 or is it better that they're above 10? You know, I, I don't know the research on this to properly give an answer. There are children who, because their parents split up when they were so young that they don't remember it, they don't know what it is they're missing. They weren't around or they don't remember the fights and the things that led up to the breakup. So they're growing up already in single-parent households. And as long as they're receiving love and they're receiving nurturing, they can turn out okay. It's the child who maybe is directly exposed to the pattern of the breakup who remembers what happens, or at least has their interpretation of what happened, that might have to carry this. And there are adults who do not fare very well when their parents split up. So I don't think it's so much an issue of what age the child is. I think it's more of an issue of has that person, regardless of their age, been taught to deal with disappointments in life. Okay, and probably and, as well how the situation in and of itself was handled with them. Exactly. If the situation was handled hand, if the situation was handled with sensitivity and maturity on the on behalf of both parents, you're going to have a kid who's got a really good shot at coming out of this not too scathed. And that's a good thing. Joining us on the show is relationship coach and columnist for the West End Times, Frank B. Kermit. Check him out at his website, www.franktalks.com. Frank, how do you tell the children that you and your partner are no longer together? Is this like a sit-down thing with the two of you? Usually it is. You sit down with your now ex-partner, and you have to really focus on how, although the nature of your relationship with your partner has changed, your relationship with your child has not changed, that you both still love your child, that you both will still be there, and you have to prepare for an outburst. The child may freak out. The child might start calling you names and start exhibiting so much anger because you've just changed such an important component in their life. You also have to be ready for the questions. What's going to happen to me? Where am I going to live? Who's going to take care of me? 
How, what if, and, and remember, let's say the child has some sort of after-school activities. Within the scope of a child's world, those things are uber important. And if you don't have an answer to say, well, we've already arranged a schedule so you can continue to do the things that are important to you, that's going to shake a child up even more. It's not just the devastation that uh, the child's parents are breaking up. It's also, how is my life as a child going to change in this? And that can also lead to lots of feelings of resentment. You have to expect that your kid is going to freak out, and you have to encourage it. You have to say, no, get it out now. Ask all of your questions out. If you're angry, that's okay. And whatever the kid says, no matter how nasty, no matter how hurtful, you have to be accepting of it. You have to show compassion. Because as devastating as it is for you as an adult in the situation, it's even more devastating for them as a child. And I'm assuming, Frank, that especially, you know, having to sit down and tell your kid, you know, you know, uh, mom and dad or dad and dad, mom and mom not going to be together anymore. Obviously, that's such a heartbreaking thing to go through, especially if you really do love your child as much as I think most parents do. How do or I guess the two parents really need to try to simmer down before they have that conversation, right? Because I think they need to work really hard at getting through their emotions so that it's the best possible conversation that they can have with their child so that the feelings between both parents are are sort of just negligible at this point. Exactly. You have to remember that it's not a time to take jabs at one another. It's not a time to put the blame as to why, uh, why you can't be with your partner anymore. There's only one goal, and the goal is to reassure the child that all of the child's needs are going to continue to be met, that it's going to be a different setup, that the child's needs will always be met, and no matter what happens, the two partners and now ex-partners are still going to work together when it comes to raising the child. And Frank, if possible, I guess it's important that both parents sit down in advance and hammer down a schedule as best they can so that the kid doesn't really feel upheaval? Exactly. The more you plan ahead for exactly what is going to take place in the care of the child, the better it is for the child. Because at that point, when two parents sit down and say, we're not going to be together anymore, and they're trying to explain this to a child, any uncertainty in addition to the fact that the child now realizes, oh, so this whole family unit thing isn't forever. Any uncertainty on top of that in terms of, well, who's going to spend Sundays with the child, that's just even more devastating to the child. The child needs some sense of schedule, some sense of belonging, some sense that I'm going to be taken care of no matter what. And you do, when you put this schedule down in writing, there has to be some flexibility because your child might turn around and say, well, wait a minute, if I'm going to spend weeknights with one parent and weekends with the other parent, but I watch Monday night show, TV show with my other parent, what's going to happen then? So you're going to have to be flexible, especially at the very beginning. That is not a time to use children as a means of getting revenge on your partner, no matter what happened in that relationship. And please tell me, Frank, that, you know, the adults are going to be smart enough you know, not to say negative things about the other parent, I guess even, you know, whether it's in front of the other parent or not, just in front of that child, because that has to be so damaging for the kid to hear that parent B wants to dismantle parent A or whatever the case may be. Okay, it's more than just dismantling for the child. You have, this is how a child interprets it. When parent A hates parent B, the child says, but I'm half parent B. So parent A must hate me just as much as parent B. That's such a good way to put it, Frank, because I think no one thinks of it, uh, thinks of it that way. Exactly, because as adults, we can separate our feelings. We know that just because we may dislike somebody's sibling, that doesn't mean we hate the person. But as a child, they don't have that emotional maturity. They don't have that capacity. So if you hate one of my parents, you must hate that part in me because I'm half of that parent. And don't think that children who are adopted are immune to this because they're still being brought up in that family unit. They still take on the character traits and the behavior traits of a parent. When you hate somebody's parent, even if it's your ex-partner, the person, the child, is going to feel you hate a good chunk of them. And that's horrible. And how do you ensure uh, that the children don't take sides or feel forced to, to take sides, Frank? Well, there are certain things we can do. First of all, don't introduce a new partner anytime soon because that puts the child in a position where they may feel guilty 
for taking sides. So let's say partner A goes out and meets a new person to start dating. Well, the child may even like the new partner of partner A, but they're going to be in a position where they say, oh, but I feel guilty because I feel like I'm betraying partner B, so I have to hate partner A's new partner. You don't put children in that situation. Make, even if you have someone new in your life, you don't introduce them to your kids because that just adds a, a new element to this. Initially, most kids are hoping that mom and dad or mom and mom and dad and dad are hoping that their parents are going to work it out. And any new person that you introduce during that very, very sensitive time could become the target of hatred saying, my parents never worked out because you came into the picture, even if the reality is that first relationship was dead, regardless of who knew comes in. And Frank, is there ever a good reason, because we've heard this, you know, for eons and eons, that certain families will stay together, you know, because until the kids are raised or the kids are old enough, is there ever a good reason for two parents to stay together on behalf of the kids for whether it's three months or a year or 10 years? Of course. Of course. Listen, there is no set rule for this. There are some families that when they're together, because they have a common goal of we're going to stick it out, we're going to stay together, we're not going to expose our kids to any sort of hurt or we're not exposing our kids to any of our own relationship dysfunctions, at least get to the point where the kid is finished school, uh, gotten their degree, started a career. Of course there's, there's, there's an argument for that because in some cases a couple splitting up might mean that both people in the couple will have less time to spend with their kids. And let's look at all of the kids right now who are being neglected. Uh, if their parents aren't spending time with them and looking after them, someone who may want to do them wrong is going to be paying them the wrong kind of attention. So there's always an argument that, hey, you got kids, you better try to work it out. And if you're not going to work it out, stick it out for as long as you can. Now, on the flip side, if the dysfunction in the relationship is something that when the children are exposed to is going to damage them further, that's when you need to leave now. So a good example of this, if you're in a relationship that is dealing with domestic violence and children being exposed to that violence and being put at risk because of that violence, well, no, there is no staying together. You've you got to move on. But if it's a matter of the two of you have irreconcilable differences, you're still friends, you like each other as people, but it's just not working out. Sometimes staying together long enough for the benefit of the kids might be a good option. There are no absolute answers in this unless you're dealing with an absolute situation like domestic violence. What's your opinion, Frank, on how the, the parents can handle their interaction with each other in the future, you know, around the kids? Uh, I, I'm assuming the more amical, the, be, uh, the amicable, the better. And I guess working through that hurt, I don't want to say as quickly as possible because I think everyone has to feel their feelings, but at least getting through it enough that you can be with that other person and be parents together. I think a key element is compassion. That's really what it comes down to it. To tolerate another person, to you know, grind your teeth, to, to bite your tongue, all of that is fine, but eventually we all have a limit as to what we can take before it starts to really uh, damage ourselves in terms of our esteem and in terms of our, in our ability to enjoy life. However, if you can look at your partner and have compassion with the understanding that, you know, my partner is just as miserable as I am in this situation, maybe even more so. We're going to end up alone after this. So let's try to have compassion for the, for the struggling and, and, and the rage that we both feel right now. I've often found that if there was one element that was missing to keep a couple from always biting each other's heads off, it's compassion. I'm not even looking at forgiveness because forgiveness is something you really do for yourself so you can move on but to offer compassion for someone to try and understand their pain and trying to say, well, I'm not happy about the situation, but I will show you compassion for the pain that you're in. Sometimes that can turn around the reason that the couple would be breaking up to begin with. Okay, that's excellent. Now, now Frank, uh, obviously this is such a, a big topic to go over, uh, you know, dealing with a breakup, the aftermath, and how you move forward. And, uh, you know, we, we've, we've based this, you know, specific talk on, on dealing with family and, and if you have children and how you move forward. Uh, but I, I want to have you back on the show because I know that you and I are going to talk about what it's like for a single person or, or without kids uh, to sort of move forward after, after a breakup. Can you just give us um, some, some thoughts on, on what we will hear when, we, when you and I talk again about this, uh, this subject? 
absolutely. When you're dealing with a breakup where you do not have children with your partner, the dynamic is very different. Because at that point, you very well may never see that person again. And that's okay. When you do have children, because your children's needs end up becoming more important than your own specific needs, especially in that moment, your behaviors are going to change. But when you don't have kids, you end up having more options in terms of how you're going to deal with your ex-partner, and even if you choose not to deal with them at all. And that's what we're going to be looking at when we talk about childless couples who are going through a breakup. Fantastic. Frank, thank you so much again for joining us on the show. Thank you, Kelly. It's always a pleasure. Again, that's Frank B. Kermit, a relationship coach and columnist for the West End Times newspaper. Again, for more information, www.franktalks.com.